Let's get serious here about this presidential race. Time to toss everything we learned from Iowa right into the cornfield because it means zero in New Hampshire. So knowing what lies ahead, is the Granite State even that critical to eventual victory? What has Marco Rubio actually done in the Senate to make him such an attractive candidate? The question's being repeated, and the junior senator's peeps are having a tough time providing an answer that doesn't sound like double talk. In case anyone forgot, there is still war raging in the Middle East. A dictator still killing his own people. And Russia's now busy spinning up its planes and missiles for a little war play. Sunday, they will play the Super Bowl, of course, but is NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell merely playing pandering games to women with his latest announcement? All right, helmets on. Chin straps buckled, break out the chips and the salsa. I'm Ed Berliner. This is the Hardline for Friday, February 5th, 2016. We have a president that can't get anybody to do anything, so he signs, you know, executive orders. And country wasn't supposed to be that way. But he signs executive orders because he can't get, he doesn't get people into the Oval Office, into offices, into something, and do something right. But make great deals. Make deals that everybody's happy with. The way the country was supposed to work, he doesn't do that. There is no place like New Hampshire when it comes to politics. For instance, in 2012, a man named Vermin Supreme was listed on the Democratic primary ballot for president, promising to provide free ponies and mandatory toothbrushing for all. He got 833 votes. And while it is against the law in the Granite State for unlicensed showmen, tumblers, and rope dancers to perform in public, the hardcore voters there enjoy the traveling roadshow that comes along every four years with its own brand of entertainers, those seeking to be president of the United States. So with Tuesday fast approaching, let us strip away the clown makeup and make some sense of the recent numbers and what is likely the reality of winning and losing there. Let's open the ballot box discourse, uh, discourse rather a little early with those who really understand New Hampshire. He is professor at Southern New Hampshire University and founder of NHPoliticalCapital.com, Dean Spiliotis. Joined by the former veteran broadcast journalist at WSMN and WMVU Radio in Nashua, New Hampshire, Ed Leishas. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for joining us here, and boy, we've got a lot to talk about. Dean, let me begin with you. We talk about all the polls here. Now we have new polls saying that, wait a minute, Bernie Sanders has got a big lead, but Hillary Clinton might be shrinking it a little bit. Donald Trump, the race is tightening. Really, why should we believe the polls right after we saw what happened in Iowa, where really they didn't tell us anything close to the truth? No, hi, Ed. It's good to be with you. You know, the reality is uh, maybe, maybe you shouldn't believe all the polls. Uh, you know, we saw back in 2008 with uh, Barack Obama. He was leading here in New Hampshire. Uh, coming into this final weekend, he was up anywhere between 8 to 11 points, depending on the poll, and uh, Hillary Clinton ended up winning. So New Hampshire voters uh, are notorious for deciding uh, late in the game. Uh, they like to get out there and see the candidates on this uh, Final weekend, we're being aided by about uh, six inches of fresh snow this morning, so that's making it interesting. And we may have an additional uh, accumulation on Tuesday. So uh, I always encourage people to just kind of wait and see because uh, the situation here is often very fluid right up until the last minute. Ed, when it comes down to that final weekend, what is it that the New Hampshire voter is looking for in their candidate that perhaps we wouldn't expect in other states come the POTUS election? Well they expect the the see me feel me touch me listen to me take my uh, questions seriously i mean politics in new hampshire is a contact sport all right now let's talk about a contact sport and the guy who believes in contact sport donald trump he seems to own his politically incorrect label every place he goes this happened last night it was a profanity laced speech in portsmouth here's what he said we're gonna knock the out of ISIS. I don't give a damn. They're ripping the out of the sea. You can tell them to go themselves. Wow. Ed, how does that sit with the usually staid New Hampshire voter? Well, I think Donald Trump might be surprised when he wakes up on uh, Wednesday morning. In fact, he out-Trumped himself last night. He went home to the city and uh, couldn't get back to New Hampshire this morning because of the storm to do an event. And uh, they tell me he's on to South Carolina now. But, uh, you know, Trump will have his followers. But, you know, last night between 5 o'clock and 10 p.m., I received no less than 19 calls from pollsters. And as uh, the, uh, Dean said, you, you can't believe the polls. They're all over the place. It's, it's going to be the ones that have done uh, the groundwork. And I think Trump is trying to make up for a lack of groundwork uh, by his team. 
Uh, he, he appeared at the uh, Manchester Police Department morning roll call yesterday because he's trying to get out. And as I said, it's see me, feel me, touch me. Uh, when George Bush was running uh, for president as vice president, one of the things, and I was involved at that campaign we did, we wanted him to meet as many New Hampshire citizens and have his picture taken with them as possible, and, and it proved uh, to be the, the right result. So the, the candidate with the good ground game and the person that's been out there meeting and talking to voters, not behind a rope line, but right down in the middle of them all, uh, they're the ones that are going to, to win the voter over. All right, now, there's a good example of this, because at a town hall last night, we're going to stay with the gentleman who up until Iowa was leading every poll, Donald Trump. A father of two girls asked Mr. Trump why his daughters should look up to the GOP frontrunner, and here was his answer. Explain to me how I can look at my daughters and have them look up to a President Trump as a role model. Well, first of all, nobody, who, who asked you to give this question? Did Anderson <laughs> Oh this this is a CNN, by the way, no, this is a not. CNN setup, but that's okay. It's not. <laughs> Nobody has more respect I, for women. Just for the record, we did that's not okay. tell I'm sure. anybody any questions. Nobody has more respect for women than I do. Dean, let's ask a flat-out question here. Is it possible that the New Hampshire voters, and certainly with questions like that, they are exposing Donald Trump for what some people hope is the show that he has no clothes, the emperor with no clothes. Yeah, well, you know, he's been unpredictable in the state all along. It's not your clip that you played. That's not the first time I've heard him using profanity. There's a little bit of shock value there, a little bit of New Yorker uh, mixed in. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we've kind of gotten used to it here. He's been leading very consistently in the polls uh, uh, throughout the fall, but that's ne not necessarily a guarantee. And I think, you know, Ed was talking a lot about, uh, the, in particular, the, th the uh, three governors, Kasich, uh, Christie, and Bush, who have invested a tremendous amount of time here on the ground, uh, but are concerned because they're seeing uh, what happened in Iowa where Marco Rubio picked up a lot of late voters. Uh, he's, Rubio's been doing well with independents. We have a lot of independent voters here uh, in our primary process. And so I think there's a real concern among, you know, these three governors who have played by the book. They've done the kinds of things you do to build an organization here. Uh, they now see these other three candidates who I believe in the most recent WMUR CNN poll. Uh, it's Trump, Rubio, and Cruz, one, two, three. Uh, those guys haven't built up the organization or spent the time here. So uh, this is going to be a really interesting test of, uh, you know, traditional theories about how New Hampshire is supposed to work. But, you know, I, I think if Trump doesn't win here, uh, people are really going to be emboldened uh, to, to hit him much harder than they have. All right. Now, let's stay there for just a moment. The emboldened factor, though. But every time we are told something like that, Dean, Donald Trump defies the odds, and he still stays in there, and he has still got those big poll numbers. So is it just possible, then, that this is the stopping point right here, that New Hampshire voters are the ones that he simply, even though the polls tell us he's got a huge lead, that they may just come in and stop him here? It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it'll happen. Right. It's hard to say. You know, we've all learned not to, not to count, out, count him out, and he has said, particularly his first day or so here after Iowa, that... Uh, he doesn't feel he needs to win. He'd like to win, but he'd be okay with second. And that he's planning on sticking around for a while. He's made these a couple of these trips down to the south. And, you know, if he wants to tap into his fortune, he could uh, absolutely stick around for a while. So I I'm not ready to write him off. Uh, you can't. But, I, but, I do, but I do think he'll be, it'll be more precarious for him if he loses again. As I said earlier this week, it is folly if you write him off. Ed, yeah, we mentioned the senators in here. Jeb Bush, Chris Christie, and John Kasich. And Kasich, actually, now getting endorsements from the Boston Globe and the New York Times. Ed, is it possible that we, the media, we are seriously under, uh, underestimating these three, specifically underestimating John Kasich? I think they have been underestimated. And again, the Trump uh, phenomenon, if you will, has, has grabbed the media spotlight. But, uh, you know, Kasich's had close to 100 town meetings. Uh, and, and, you know, he gets out into the crowd and he walks in and when he meets people for a second or third time, he's calling them by their first name. Same with Governor Christie. Uh, only up until the other morning, I had an opportunity finally to hear him speak in person. Uh, and he, and he, he comes across, he's charisma with the audience. And, and you know, Jeb played the, the Trump card last night, pardon the pun, but uh, his mother was there. And Barbara Bush <laughs> is loved and has a long following uh, in New Hampshire and how that translates. Who knows? Ed, 20 seconds here. Your gut feeling as to what will happen on the left and the right come Tuesday night. Well, Bernie Sanders wins, but don't count Hillary out because the same thing happened to Bill in 92 when Paul Songus from Massachusetts 
uh, a neighbor won uh, the Republican. Uh, I just don't think it'll be Trump. Could be Rubio, uh, Kasich, Christie, and then Cruz. Wow, now that would be a little bit of an upset in a lot of people's books. 20 seconds to you then, Dean, same question. Uh, you know, I think on the, on the Democratic side, I think it's going to be hard for Hillary Clinton to, to catch Bernie Sanders. I think they're just hoping to close the gap a bit uh, and then head on to South Carolina. On the Republican side, it does feel, as Ed said, like Marco Rubio is getting some momentum here. And we're all basically waiting to see which one of those three governors, if any of them, uh, is going to break away a little bit. Kasich seems to be headed in that direction. Uh, but I've seen polls where, you know, Bush has been up as well. So uh, so we'll know just in about three or in about four days or so. If Donald Trump does not win on Tuesday night, one can only hope the entertainment value of what will happen the next day will be incredible. Ed Leishas, Dean Spiliotis. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Uh, get somebody else to shovel out those drives, will you please? The Hardline continues.